I often find myself suddenly in this position where I've agreed to speak and that it hasn't dawned on me until I get here that I'm the only amateur in the room talking to a whole lot of people who are professionals and this is your life's work and uh, I'm only a journalist. But anyway, here goes. I'm sitting next to Matthew Whitaker too, who's the person I ring up to ask questions. <laughs> tell, me, tell me what is the, the evidence on this, that and the other because the Resolution Foundation is one of the uh, first ports of call for a lot of, a lot of journalists. I mean, the evidence for, well, I don't know, half a century has been piling up and piling up. It's accelerated from the 1980s when interest in it really took off. But because the, it's the decade when, as you said, when inequality really took off in an astronomic way. So you have a lot of organizations. You have the IFS, you have the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, you have the LSE's Case Department, Kings College's Policy Institute, Nuffield College, Oxford, where the founding work of uh, Peter Townsend uh, looked at the nature of, policy, of poverty and uh, how, how to uh, measure it in different ways that might engage people. And of course, lots more university departments, lots more organizations like IFF and many others, all churning out absolutely fascinating, vital, important evidence and, and research. Um, it's, um, there are really many too many sort of experts. It's almost an industry in, in poverty and inequality research, too many to, to name check them all. And of course, government departments, which a lot of you come from, themselves producing voluminous research, which I wish was published. I might say Paul Johnson giving, of the IFS giving a lecture the other day, begged the government to consider publishing more of the work that all of you do that often <coughs> never gets to see the light of day. I mean, almost every week, a serious work rounds by this. Today, went into the office, there was Danny Dawling's latest, uh, Peak Inequality, Britain's Ticking Time Bomb, and he writes terrific books uh, on the subject. And I just flipped through to look at the graphs when I was on my way here on the tube, and sure enough, here is the income inequality, Gini coefficient in OECD countries. This will be a... Uh, a, a graph well known to all of you. Well, we are right up there at the, in the top few for inequality, and of course at the bottom there is Iceland, Norway, Denmark, Slovenia, Finland, as you would expect. Or you can turn to his uh, page 51, another familiar chart to all of you, which is the proportion of GDP spent on public services. Um, and again, we are near the bottom. Most of the countries we would compare ourselves with are up in the late 40s or 50s for uh, spending. That is all absolutely invaluable information that everybody needs and we need to get out there as much as we can. I mean, I think it's a very hard task for academic researchers because when they're doing research, they get measured these days on their impact as well. Uh, they get marks for impact in their ref scores. And uh, that's pretty tough. If you have a government, <coughs> quite a lot of governments, that are not much interested in uh, social research or in the, uh, in, in the evidence before their eyes, how do you prove that you've had an impact? What is an impact if nobody's listening? Or at least if the politicians and the policy makers are not listening? I think all this research has had some effect, at least on political discourse, and that you do now hear Politicians increasingly of every hue always paying lip service to equality of opportunity, even to greater equality itself, which was a taboo word during the new Labour years. They to talk about social exclusion and, and other things, but the E word wasn't allowed in, and now you hear it everywhere. Think of Theresa May on the steps of Downing Street talking about burning social injustices. I mean, it may not live to a lot of action. But at least it's up there as a thought, as an endeavor, as something by which she herself would expect to be measured at the end of her time, perhaps, possibly. Uh, it's, it, it is a change in language, I think, that has come from all of this, of this research. But you have to say that when Ian Duncan Smith unveiled universal credit, within a very short time of coming to office, you didn't feel a great deal of studying of the intricacies of the benefit system and the considerable research on that had gone into that uh, endeavour and we are living with the
consequences. But as you suggested, you know, Michael Gove's casual throwaway remark about people have had enough of experts sort of hit home. And it chimes, I think, with the experience of a great many people in the research world who too often found that politicians prefer their own natural reflex, their gut instinct, the things that they've been saying on platforms about what they know works because it makes common sense. Uh, rather than evidence and statistics. And even when the chief statistician calls them up short, very often they repeat the same abuse of statistics. Again, it doesn't seem to be much uh, effect of his reprimand. Um, but, you know, governments do sometimes set out with very good intentions to use evidence. I think 1997 was the high point when Labour arrived in office after being out of power for so long eager for research. Bring it to us, they said. We want all your evidence. We want everything we do to be evidence-based. And they set out with that intention. And it was a real bonanza for social research in those years, early years. They summoned 18 task forces of experts to look at every cause and possible cure of poverty uh, and social exclusion. And uh, that was very exciting. And they produced fantastic reports, 18 terrific reports. And it did lead to good things such as tax credits and pension credits, which took a million children out of poverty and a million pensioners out of poverty uh, before there was even the triple lock on pensioners. Um, pensioners became the least the group least likely to be poor. Uh, and they did see a need for long-term remedies. 3,500 sure starts were set up very much on the back of evidence that catching babies, catching families young is what makes all the difference. And the evidence came from one very, very valuable piece of research, came from part of the American Head Start program called the Perry High Scope uh, program, where they researched, uh, they put children into <coughs> early year, a very particular and disciplined early year scheme to help families at home and monitored those children all the way through until their 30s, compared with a control group didn't get the same treatment, and they found a significant difference in the amount of crime, and numbers who went to prison, the numbers who ended up homeless with mental illnesses or sicknesses of any kind, a, 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 a very marked difference between those who'd been helped in the early years. And that was a piece of evidence that really was the founding, the foundation of Sure Start. But it takes years to create and embed in a program like that so that everybody understands and expects a sure start to be there as certainly as they expect a primary school to be there. And getting it right takes a long time. Some of them were better than others. Um, and it was too short a time to collect real evidence. And there is, of course, no follow through uh, with evidence. And the evidence <coughs> that they did collect will not be of much use in the future. And of course, when austerity came in and councils found themselves uh, now with nearly half their grant uh, cut, the non-statutory sure start was one of the first things to go. And although it remains a name in some places, a thousand have closed, and many of the others no longer have any of the things in it that could really have been life-transforming for children. And that often is the fate you find a policy after policy, sometimes within the space of one government, that a new minister comes in and wants to do something new, wants to put their own thumbprint on a new policy, they can call their own and rather puts on the back burner whatever their predecessor has been doing. And very often policies don't have time to bed in and certainly are not monitored in a way that you can then say that worked, that didn't, or why did that work, or why didn't that. And I think here we are, inevitably we're going to mention Brexit. We've already broken the ice on mentioning Brexit. I think it did reveal the depth of rifts in society in a very raw way, and of course they had been a very long time brewing. It was no great surprise to people who've been doing research over the years. The split between the old and the young, between the metropolitan and the small town people, between those with degrees and those with low qualifications. Those, some people would say, with an open or a closed mindset between the nativists and the internationalists. Um, these weren't new divisions, but they were brutally exposed and emphasized by, uh, and made dangerously deeper by a very crude referendum question into which everybody could pour every difference that they had. Um, 
And I think inequality lay very close to the heart of what happened <coughs> in that. Not a day passes when you don't get more evidence about uh, the great social divide. But today it's shelter, rising homelessness, standing one in 200 people is ho officially homeless in the wrong streets, but they are homeless. Uh, you get research almost every day about children going hungry to school, or research showing that the knife murders are almost entirely amongst groups of children, or them are children, and young people who are from the poorest uh, backgrounds and who have often been excluded from schools, as schools off-roll their difficult children in order to keep up uh, with their standards. Uh, the shocking rise in infant mortality figures this year, for the first time in decades, uh, has come as a, as a surprise. Um, so you can't say there's a lack of evidence, a uh, lack of, of good statistics. You can't say anyone doesn't know. But people will produce different <coughs> arguments, political arguments, depending on which side of the, the line they are. Uh, you know, there will be arguments about, well, the Gini coefficient for monitoring inequality it fluctuates a little bit up and down, but basically it's been plateaued since uh, the 1990s. But governments claim to small differences, look for excuses. Uh, who is to blame? Is it the poor themselves? Who else might it be? Uh, we know those arguments very well. And uh, the truth is that by now we do have all the evidence that we need. I'm sorry all you diligent researchers, but <laughs> we've got a great deal of it. And whether you're going to measure poverty as a numerical measure, 60% of the median, or whether you're going to measure it uh, in the, on the minimum standards uh, measure of saying, well, let's ask the people what they think is the minimum a child should have to stay just above the poverty threshold, like one overcoat, two pairs of shoes, three good meals a day, one week's holiday a year, a birthday party, an outing once a month, those are the basics uh, that, that people think that children should have, and more and more children are falling below that. Um, but the evidence is there, reaching out. The question is how you use that evidence to reach out to a population, to hold up that mirror to a society, to show them the true face of how we live now. And how do you use it to convince an electorate? Um, that investing in a more equal society is in everybody's interest. I mean, one of the best efforts was definitely Wilkinson and Pickett's The Spirit Level, because it drew useful lines showing that the happiest countries are the most equal, and they suffer least crime, least mental illness, and even the best of feel better, are happier, feel better about themselves in less unequal countries. Uh, it was so effective that its political enemies spent a great deal of Try and trying to unpick their methodology, pointing to outliers, exceptions, peculiarities. But I think the broad sweep of their reasoning did have quite a strong impact. I suppose in my own way, I've spent most of my life reporting in one way or another uh, and using the research that I get from professional researchers, but trying to turn these dry facts and figures into something people can emotionally connect with. <coughs> Um, so I wrote a book called Hard Work, Life in Low Paper. And when I went out and took jobs myself, I went and lived in a, a council estate and took jobs in the, uh, in the local job centre. Um, I didn't want to write about abject poverty, that wasn't the point. I wanted to write about ordinary low paid work and, and life. And could you, could you live on the minimum wage? And how do you manage on the minimum wage? Which is why I did it as an experiment, living in a council flat, paying everything you would pay working out uh, whether you could get by, well, you can just get by, but on, you know, on the narrow, narrowest of, of margins. So I took a job as a, a care assistant in a nursing home, I worked with a cake packing factory, uh, as a hospital porter, as a nursery assistant, a call centre, uh, and some other jobs. And I did it that way, I mean, I could have just gone and interviewed people doing that, those jobs, but I did it that way because I wanted people to read books to come on a journey, if you like, as a sort of travelogue, saying, look, this is how it would feel if you were doing those jobs. People who perhaps themselves have never, would never have done jobs like that. It's a way of trying to get people to connect 
with other real lives. And what you find, I find, I suppose, is how unbelievably hard people work, but with what good grace, how strong the work ethic is, how hard people are willing to work for very little more money than they would get on benefits. So the idea that people are essentially psychos, the amazing thing is that there is a vast workforce of people willing to do pretty nasty jobs for very little at the beck and call of their employers and treated pretty badly and pretty rudely. I mean, I find myself, I mean, these just two funny anecdotes, I was sent back to a hospital that I know very well. I went and got a job there as a hospital porter. And actually, I, as BBC Social Affairs, but because I cover health a lot, I knew a lot of the consultants there. But when I was wearing the uniform and pushing a trolley or a wheelchair, the consultants would pass me by utterly not recognising you. Because once you were on the, as it were, the other side of the green baize door, once you were on the manual side, the professional side just don't see you, you're a cleaner, you're a whatever your tabard says you are. And so uh, they would just blank me. Another occasion, I was walking down Whitehall with a triple buggy and leads with several toddlers, so where I was being a nursery assistant, pushing along Whitehall. Who should come tripping down the street? Some days when Labour was in power, Peter Mandelson and a flotilla of assistants and aides of one kind or another absolutely passed me by like this. I know quite well that I was wearing the nursery tabard and I was that thing and no longer a person. And I think that doing that sort of thing yourself and trying to describe it to other people was the purpose of trying to put flesh and blood into the statistics about inequality and what it's like to be uh, regarded as a low esteemed person in a low esteemed job, however vital that job might be. I think the real shock though was when I took, I'd done, I'd done this before in the, um, when I first started out in journalism, I was a middle class girl, totally clueless, I set off and took jobs around the country. I worked in Lucas's car parts in Birmingham, I worked in Cape Lions, factory in London. I joined the army for a bit. I did a number of different jobs and I wrote a book then called The Work of Life. So I had over 30 years comparison between these two books. So I took my payslip in pounds, shillings and pence from my first book and my payslip from the same hospital. I'd worked in the same <coughs> hospital as a ward orderly, the same grade of job. And my payslip from the second time I went to do this to the IFS and said, right, can you work out for me in real terms? what the difference in pay is. It might have gone up so much. I thought it might be quite flat. I was very shocked when they came back and said, actually, it's nearly a third less. That's working in the NHS. So we talk about the shooting up of inequality, being something very real, that pay at the top shot up, and pay at the bottom is nailed down. And that's what really happened in that time. And that was, to me, an, an extraordinary finding that I hadn't really quite expected. Um, but my only other contribution, I might say, to social research was another book I wrote with uh, David Walker called Unjust Rewards, which was looking at uh, trying to look at the very rich. The most difficult thing we did in it, and I think researchers find it most difficult, is to try and research the top 1%. They are very hard to get your hands on. You don't really know what they're up to, where they are. They're very slippery. Um, but with the help of one or two people, eventually, we got two focus groups of the mega <coughs> people earning between half a million and 10 million. They were city lawyers, city bankers, um, uh, as hedge funders. We had two different uh, focus groups with them. We didn't think they'd believe us, so we brought Professor John Hill from the LSE. We got Ipsos Mori. <coughs> to do the figures for us. And we asked them each to fill out forms as they came in, saying what they thought other people earned, and where they thought they were on the scale, and where they thought the poverty line was, and had them all put up on a screen. And then John Hills would give the real facts. But they were utterly stunned to find they were so mildly wrong. Um, I mean, they thought that sort of um, about, they thought that about 60% were in the higher earnings bracket at that point, it was only 10% in the 40% 40% and above bracket. They thought the poverty line was twice what it actually was. Uh, they kept saying, everybody, everybody we know. 
They had no <laughs> idea what kind of bubble they lived in. They're utter clueless. And they were responsible for running our money, uh, for running our finances, and yet clueless about the society they lived in. I mean, most people don't have much idea. I mean, they put themselves, of course, much nearer the middle, because they knew somebody richer than them. There are people with yachts and people with yachts and crews. Um, <laughs> there are lots of dividing lines, and everybody, who are too, I'm afraid, put themselves near in the middle, because they usually know somebody worse off, so they think there must be more middling than they are. So, again, your research needs to get out there so people can at least see where they are themselves on the scale. Um, and I do think, it, you know, I do think that that is the real problem. I think the question for everybody now is how do you have impact? How do you get it out there? How do you make your research count and matter? And how, that's by far the most difficult question. Doing the numbers is relatively easy. Doing the dissemination is considerably harder. I'll stop there.